Well, we welcome you here to City Light to the 1145 service. You should be the most rowdy bunch because you've got the most sleep. Amen? So y'all... Y'all stay with me and uh, get loud with me, and uh, we're going to have a great time. But today we continue our series entitled Last Steps. And what we're doing is, is we're diving into Scripture and we're studying some of the last steps of Jesus, some of the last moments, some of the last encounters. And what we have discovered is that some of those last moments and last steps of ministry had some of the greatest impact in the, in the world. And we've also learned in this series that his last steps can become our first steps of new life and transformation. And so as we trace his last steps, as we learn these different things about Jesus and who he is, that they actually have the ability of changing us and transforming our lives. And today we're getting to the end of the end of some of his last steps on his earthly ministry. Uh, Today we're actually going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, which could be one of the most powerful moments in the life and ministry of Jesus outside of his death and resurrection. And today, we're going to trace his steps all the way to Matthew chapter 26 and look at what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I've entitled this message, The Battle in the Garden. The Battle in the Garden. I don't know if you have realized this yet or not in your life, But victories that really matter rarely come easy. I want you to think about some of the greatest purposes and calls and like missions that God has called you to. They rarely come easy. Anything that you're going to do that has eternal significance, it's never going to happen without opposition. It's never going to happen without a fight. It's never going to happen without a battle. It's never going to happen without a struggle. So the same is true for you and I. The same is true for Jesus. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to die for the sins of humanity. He's about to once and for all completely defeat the enemy. He's going to overcome death, hell, and the grave. And as he got closer to that major victory that would literally change the world as we know it, all hell is coming against him. Everything is trying to stop him. Everything that could come against him has come against him. Think about the things that he's going through in his life. One of his good friends, one of his closest disciples, Judas, by the way, who he's poured into for the last three years, has given himself to, has decided to betray him for a few pieces of silver. And he knows he's going to be arrested because of this betrayal. He knows that he is going to be crucified. And he's, his last steps in this garden are filled with internal struggle. They're filled with external struggle. And we're going to learn so much from him today. Because maybe you're here and you're in a battle right now. You're going through it. You're in the middle of your own crisis. You're in the middle of your own tragedy. You're in the middle of your own external battle or your internal struggle. And you've got things coming against you. And you feel like everything that could be going wrong is going wrong. Uh, Maybe everything seems to be falling apart. Maybe you're like, my marriage is falling apart. Uh, My business, my career, my job, everything that could shake is being shook up right now. And maybe it's not just uh, the external things that you have going on, but the battles that really cause the most damage in our lives are the battles on the inside. It's not necessarily the things that are going on on the outside that really have the power to affect me, but it's really the battles that are going on on the inside, the anxiety, the the depression, the discouragement, the insecurity, the sleepless nights. And maybe you just feel like you're being crushed underneath the weight of something that you don't have the power to lift. And if you're here today and you can resonate with that just the least bit, I believe with every fiber of my being that God has directed you here to this church on this day to hear this message, to speak hope, and to give you help, and to bring about healing and strength in your life. Do you believe that God of heaven could speak into your situation today? Does anybody believe that? Just just wave at me. About 10 of you? That's great. Wonderful. We're going to work on the rest of you. (laughs) You should not be asleep still, okay? Like, come on. Um, 
But I really do believe that God wants to do something significant in all of our lives. I just, I just want to get you on the edge of your seat and just know that God doesn't have you here by happenstance. And I want you to know this. The devil didn't lead you here today, okay? The devil is mad that you're here today. He is upset that you are here today because he knows he's about to lose territory and ground in your mind, in your heart, and in your life because you're going to leave this place differently than you walked into this place. If you believe that, give God some praise right now. I just want you to know that this doesn't just have to be another sermon. You jot a few notes down, you leave just like you came. No, you can leave this place different, better, stronger than when you walked into it if you'll really lean in to the word of God. And I feel like I need to tell somebody today that's going through a struggle, you're going to make it to the other side. You're going to make it through this. It's not going to be without pain. It's not going to be without resistance. But I want you to know this. It's not going to be this way forever. And God will pull you through. God is faithful. And what you think is actually destroying you, God's going to use it to strengthen you. And you're going to come out better and you're going to come out stronger on the other side as you lean on the Father through this battle in your life. Now, in these last steps, Jesus is in the middle of his greatest struggle. Just think about this. This is Satan's last chance to beat him before he goes to the cross. So he's coming after him. He's bringing everything that he has. He's thinking to himself, if I can stop Jesus from dying on the cross, I can keep all these people bound. And so he's trying to get the victory. And the battle in the garden, this is the place where the enemy tries to get you to abandon God's will for your life. So if you're in it right now, just know this. The enemy is hoping that you'll give up on God. He's hoping that you'll give up on coming to church. He's hoping that you'll give up on God's word. He's hoping that you'll give up on the dream and the ministry that God put in your heart. He's hoping that you'll give up on God's will and God's perfect plan for your life. So how do we keep from giving up when we're in the battle? How do we keep marching forward? How do we not give up on the marriage that we know God wants to restore? How do we not give up on the ministry that God has called us to get engaged in? How how do we not give up on God and his plan and his will for our lives when all of hell is coming against us? We're going to discover it today. So very quickly, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. We're going to look at some of these last steps, and we're going to see how Jesus overcame because how he overcame is how we can overcome, okay? And so it says this, it says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and we're going to talk about that, and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further because Jesus always goes a little further. And aren't you glad that he does? And aren't you glad that he did? And he fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. (laughs) And he said to Peter, I like it that he called Peter out. They're all asleep, but he just calls Peter out. Because Peter's the one that said, all these other disciples will deny you, but I'll never deny you. They'll all leave you and flee, but I won't. And the one that was the loudest was the one that was the weakest. And he looks at Peter and says, what? Everybody shout, what? What? Could you not watch with me for just one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Which, by the way, he did, didn't he? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time. Somebody shout, a third time. time. Saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He's like, the time has come. 
these last steps as he is getting ready to go to the cross to take on the punishment that we deserved as he died and suffered and bled for the sins of humanity. He's like, this is what I've been trying to tell you all about. The time has come. Now, I want us to break this down very quickly, and I want to give us three things that we need to remember when the battle rages in your life. Three things when you feel like you're being squeezed. And the first one we need to remember is, number one, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. This thing called life is not easy. In fact, Jesus told you and I, he gave us a promise that we don't really like to claim. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Anybody got any trouble in your life? That promise has been fulfilled. His word is true. Amen. He said, you're going to have trouble. But then he said, take heart for I have overcome the world. I've overcome it all. So, but you're not going to have a problem-free life. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have pain. You're going to have sorrow. And you're going to hurt. And, and if you're like, I don't hurt, I'm like, me and God are tight. I'm a superhero Christian. I don't ever hurt. I don't ever cry. I don't ever, I don't ever get upset. I don't ever have sorrow. I don't, I don't ever get deeply distressed. Well, it could be that you're just really good at one or two things. You're either really good at suppressing your pain and your hurt which is extremely dangerous, or you're really good at putting on a show. Because Jesus hurt, and you ain't stronger than Jesus. So if Jesus struggled, then we're going to struggle. If Jesus hurt, then we're going to hurt. If he went through things, you and I are going to go through things. He wept, he hurt, he was sorrowful. The son of God, the great I am. And, and if we say we never struggle or we never hurt, we're either lying to ourselves or we're putting on a show. You're going to go through some things that hurt. And I wish I could tell you because you're a Christian, you're never going to go through things that hurt. And I wish I could tell you because you're a Christian, nobody's ever going to lie about you. I wish I could tell you because you're a Christian, nobody's ever going to gossip about you. I wish I could tell you that because you're a Christian, you're never going to feel alone or unappreciated or isolated. You're going to go through things and it's going to hurt and it's not going to be easy. And here's why pain and adversity hurt so, so bad. Here's why the battle in the garden is so intense. Trials and pain create uncertainty. The most painful struggles in our lives, the reason why they're most difficult, is because they bring such great uncertainty, and uncertainty produces fear and panic. Have you ever got fearful before? Have you ever panicked about something before, right? Like sometimes if you're not careful, you'll just kind of live in constant panic mode, right? And that is not the way to live. But so Jesus is under so much pressure and so much stress that the gospel writer Luke tells us that he began to sweat like big drops of blood. It's the uncertainty. It's not knowing how the story ends. You and I, we struggle with this because we don't know how things are going to turn out. You don't know how the career path is going to turn out. What you thought you were so certain of at one point, now you're not so sure of because of inflation, because of layoffs and pandemics and all the things that you've been through in your career. Now you're thinking to yourself, maybe there's a different career. I'm, I'm uncertain in my life. Maybe you thought, man, my marriage is always going to be strong. It's always going to be awesome. It's always going to have Jesus at the center. And then selfishness comes in and affairs come in and brokenness comes in. And now you're thinking to yourself, I'm a little uncertain about how this is going to turn out. Maybe you've got kids, maybe you've got a son, maybe you've got a daughter, and you thought, man, they're going to grow up, and they're going to you know, be a man of God, be a woman of God, and now they're taking a different turn, and what you thought you were so certain of, what you were so hopeful of, now you find yourself walking through a journey that has great uncertainty. Have you ever been uncertain about something before? Maybe you're going through great loss. Maybe, maybe you lost someone that you loved dearly. Maybe it was 10 days ago. Maybe it was 10 years ago. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I'm ever going to get through the sorrow and this brokenness I feel in my heart and in my life. And then let's say you finally get to a place where you're willing to face this hurt and you're willing to talk about it with someone that is a friend of yours and you tell them what you're going through and you tell them how bad you hurt sometimes you'll open up to people and then they'll kind of make you feel like you're overreacting. They won't ever really tell you that, but by the way that they respond to you opening up and sharing your heart, 
it's almost like they're saying to you, hey, you just kind of need to get over it. And then some of those people just say, hey, you know, you're going to get through this. You're going you're gonna to get over this. Man. You're going to overcome, you know, and all this. And they tell you the little cute Christian responses. And, and they tell you things like, oh, I completely understand what you're going through. No, you don't. You still have what I lost. You don't know what I know and how I feel. You, don't, you can't know how I'm experiencing this because you're not me. You know, those people that come and say, I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't. In fact, that's probably one of the worst things you can tell somebody when they open up and share their hurt and their pain with you. I know exactly how you feel. Wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus would just let us slap those people one time? Just one, just give us a pass. Just one slap. Just like one slap a year. Wouldn't that be awesome? Jesus, you can slap one person a year and it would be fully, completely, and totally okay, you know? And th- that's kind of what you want to do because... Because no, you don't understand how I feel. You don't understand what I'm going through. I appreciate you trying to, you know, have empathy. I appreciate you trying to, to, to join me in this. But, but you people really don't have a clue. Uncertainty. And, and this makes sense when it's you and I. Because I understand when you and I go through trials and tragedy. And it brings uncertainty. And we're sorrowful. And we're distressed. But this is not an ordinary person in our verse today. This is Jesus the only begotten of the Father. This is the one who has no beginning and has no end. This is the one who has always existed in the Godhead of the Trinity. Who Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God. Let that sink in. He's the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And watch this. And in him all things consist. Where John said in John 1, 1 that in the beginning he was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him and nothing, and without him nothing was made that was made. Jesus knows how the story begins. And according to John the Revelator, he knows how the story ends. But face to face with the process that the Father took him through to prepare him for the cross. You see, I can have the promise, believe the promise, and claim the promise, but then come head on into the process. And the process and the struggle can be so staggering, you begin to wonder and you begin to lose confidence in the promises of God's word. Because you know God promised you that you're going to make it through this. I know he said that he is the author and the finisher and he who began a good work in me will complete it until the day of Christ. I know the verse that says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know it says that he'll never leave me and he'll never forsake me. I know he says that he's working all things for my good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But with this storm that's raging in my life and with this trial in my life, this tragedy, I believe, but I wonder. And uncertainty can overtake you if you're not careful. And so I just need to tell you, it's going to hurt. It's not going to be easy. In fact, if life was easy, you probably wouldn't see your need for Jesus anyways. And so when you hurt, just know that God is going to use it. It is designed to bring you to the Father. It's designed to bring you to your knees where you cry out to him. It's designed for you to have an intimacy with him that you would never. Because here's what I know. When all hell is breaking loose in your life, you pray more. (laughs) You you talk to God a little bit more. Are you all with me today? You realize that you need him. More than, I'm telling you, there's something about pressure, there's something about being squeezed, there's something about going through something that's bigger than yourself that makes you realize how badly you need God in your life. So it's going to hurt, but it's going to bring me to the Father. And the second thing we have to be reminded of today, that prayer is your greatest weapon. How many praying saints up in the house of the Lord today? Like some praying people up in here. Like prayer is your greatest weapon. Because when you pray... It's not by your power or by your might, but it's by his power. It's not you that's moving. It's not you that's coming through. It's the power of God that is coming through. In fact, how did Jesus beat the devil? Well, two different major battles. One was in the wilderness, 
And when he was in the wilderness, Jesus had the word in him. And when he was tempted, the word of God came out of him. So he had word in him that he could use to combat the enemy. And he got the victory. Because every time the enemy tempted him, he quoted a verse from Deuteronomy. Well, he had the word in him. See, for some of us, the first step is this, that I get into the word, right? I get into it daily. You know, I need, I, this needs to be daily bread. But it goes deeper than that, where I just don't get into it, but I actually let it get into me. Because when it gets into me, it's going to come out of me at the proper time when I need it the most. And the reason why a lot of us lose ground to the enemy and we don't get the victory and he's whooping our tails is because we ain't got no word in us. Jesus had the word in him and it came out of him. The second time is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he overcomes the enemy and his attacks through prayer. The power of prayer. Now think about Jesus. He prays the same prayer three times. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? He doesn't pray something new. He doesn't come up with something more articulate the second time or the third time. He prays the same prayer three times. And you know those people that will tell you, well, if you're a Christian, you should pray for it one time. And if you pray for it twice, it's a sign that you're doubting. So what are you trying to say Jesus was doubting? What was Jesus doing? Was he doubting himself? You know, what? Well, are you serious? Because Jesus prayed the same prayer over and over again. Now, if you're here and you've never gone through anything, <laughs> you wouldn't understand what in the world would make a person pray the same thing over and over and over and over again. You, if you've never really been through anything that's bigger than you, that's overwhelmed you, you wouldn't understand what in the world would make a person keep praying the same prayer day in and day out. You know where you get so overwhelmed by something and the pressure is so strong and the battle is so intense where you come to God and you say, God, it's me. I ain't got nothing new from yesterday. I'm coming to you because I don't have nowhere else to turn to, God, and nothing else is working for me, and nobody else can help me, and nothing else can fix me. So, God, I'm coming to you because I'm desperate for you, and I've got this situation, and I need your help. And you barely could get that out. And then day two rolls around. He said, God, it's me again. I ain't got no updates, no praise reports. <laughs> nothing has really changed down here. But God, I'm coming to you with the same thing I came with you yesterday and the day before and the week before. And there's sometimes when you go through things that are so strong, crisis and tragedy that are so big, you don't have anything else that you can really pray for in your life. Matter of fact, somebody gives you a prayer question, like, sorry, I can't get it in. It's like, and, and sometimes you need to be a little bit selfish. Sometimes it's okay for you. In fact, you will go through things that are so much bigger than you that you won't even be able to pray yourself. And the Bible says when you can't, the Holy Spirit will pray for you. Isn't that awesome? That the Holy Spirit will do what you can't do, where I can't, he, he can. But Jesus is so, in this moment, his humanity, his flesh, in this moment, he's praying the same thing. And he prays the same words three times in a row. And maybe you're going through something like that right now. And, and here's, here's where you have to be careful. And here's where you have to be cautious. Because there are some things that you are praying for God to intervene. And you're praying for God to move. And you feel like God isn't hearing you. He is, by the way, this news flash. Or you feel like God is just moving slow. And if you're not careful, instead of waiting on God you'll end up turning to something else to get some relief. Here's what I want you to be cautious of whenever you're in a battle. Beware of quick fixes. Because they are exactly what they are, a quick fix. And they relieve you in a flash, but in a moment, all of the pain and the hurt are back. Because here's the thing. We hate pain. We want to avoid pain. We don't want physical pain. Come on. Come on, somebody. When you go to the dentist, it's like gas me up, numb me up. Are you all with me today? But I'm telling you, I feel just a little bit. Nope, nope, nope. I'm telling you, I feel just a little tiny little something, a little tingle. You shoot me with something else. Are y'all with me? Like, I don't want to, how many of y'all, I don't want to feel nothing. That's my dentist story, but some of you, that's your life story. I don't want to feel anything. So let me swallow this pill. Let me take this drink. Let me get two glasses of wine just to go to sleep every night. 
And it's turned into something that you're turning to for deliverance, and it's not delivering. So if you see the picture in the passage, Jesus is going to the Father, and then he's going to check on his friends. <laughs> you see him? This is something else that but Jesus is going back and forth to the Father and then to the friends. To the Father, I'm getting a little stronger. I go to the friends, I'm getting a little frustrated. Because every time I come to my boys over here who are supposed to be praying for me, who I've poured my life into for three years, can't even pray for me for one hour. And then he goes back to the Father. And he goes back to the friends. I want you to know something. Jesus didn't get what he needed by turning to his friends. He got what he needed by turning to his heavenly Father. And you will get what you need by going to the Father. Some of you right now, you turn to your friends before you turn to the Father. Something goes wrong and you, ain't got, you can't got the money for a bill to pay. You call so-and-so before you even call upon him. And Jehovah Jireh is your neighbor, your friend, not your God. You run out of sugar. I don't know. God, give me sugar. I'm going <laughs> to pray for that before you go to your neighbor. But I'm just saying, isn't it crazy that we'll turn to everybody else before we turn to the Father? And so some of you, you're turning to something. In fact, you are putting so much faith in a friend, a spouse, and your expectation on them is Jesus. And that's why you're disappointed in your relationships. That's why you're disappointed in your marriage. Because you are expecting your husband or your wife to be Jesus. And they can't. He is far from it, okay? <laughs> That's funny. You should laugh. <laughs> he ain't Jesus, sweetheart. I don't care how much he pray. I don't care how spiritually. I don't care how much faith he He is trying to be like Jesus, but he ain't Jesus. And she isn't either. And as long as you put that expectation on each other, your marriage will never thrive. Because you're expecting them to be the perfect son of God, and they are far from it. You've got a friend that's let you down. Guess what? That's human. That's normal. Your friends are going to let you down. Quit putting so much faith in them. In fact, we can see how much faith you're putting in your friends by how offended you get when they're not there for you. Put way too much confidence in them. They're fallen people. You've let them down. They're going to let you down. So it could be friends you're turning to. Here's what I want to ask you. Where is the place or who is the person that you're turning to for help that only Jesus can give? Because for some of us, it may not be a friend. For some of us, it's a website. For some of us, it's a substance. For some of us, it's, it's, it's an affair. For some, it's work. Listen, listen. It could be a good thing that you're turning to, but it ain't Jesus. You say, nah, pastor, my husband's my rock. He is a weak rock. <laughs> I am too. We will crumble under pressure. Now, my wife is my rock. Well, that's, 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 that's a weak rock you're turning to. And they will let you down, and that rock will crumble under pressure. But I have found the rock of my salvation. His name is Jesus Christ. And when others let me down, and when people let me down, he never lets me down. You know, isn't it, isn't it amazing? Can you relate to this? You got that friend? Yo, man, anytime you need me, call me. I got you. Bro, I don't care if it's 2 in the morning. Call me. I got you. Bro, you sleep with your phone on silent. Do not disturb. <laughs> I could have died. How many of y'all sleep with do not disturb? Just raise your hand in the air. Golly. That's it? The rest of y'all need to go home and get a good night's rest. There's this awesome thing on your phone. Do not disturb. It don't light up. It don't vibrate. Pastor Kenny, you call me at 2 in the morning? Sorry, I, I live through the night. Normally, <laughs> don't be texting me, 911, Pastor, it's an emergency. I'll call, and it's like, I don't know. It's never the emergency that it looks like it's going to be. <laughs> and I've learned, normally they're going to live through the night, and I can call them in the morning when I'm not with my family or with my kids. Are y'all with me today? So I can't be your 2 a.m. friend. Call on Jesus. Because when you can't reach the pastor, you can reach the shepherd. He's so much better than me. I'm going to let you down. I'm going to disappoint you. But he's got you on speed dial. He don't ever have his phone on silent or do not disturb. It's on ring and he'll pick it up. And you can cry out to him. He's a present help in time of trouble. And so, 
And he goes to the Father, and finally, he makes contact with the Father, and now he's ready to do what God sent him to do. He's ready to face his betrayer. Which brings me to my last point, and I'll say this as we wrap up. God turns pain into purpose. So what do I need to remember? I need to remember that number one, it's going to hurt. And then number two, I need to remember that prayer is my greatest weapon. And then number three, I need to remember he turns pain into purpose. He's going to turn that thing around for a great purpose. All the pain that Jesus went through, through the betrayal, through, through being arrested, through being wrongfully accused, through, through the scourging, through the beating, and through him even dying on a cross where all of hell was celebrating because the devil thought he had won. But before they could get the party hats out, on day three, early Sunday morning, he rises from the dead. And just know, if he rose from, from it, you're going to rise from it too. That he can take the grave and turn it into a garden. He can take something as terrible as a blood-stained cross and turn it into an empty tomb in three days. And if he can do that, there's nothing he can't turn around in your life. Amen? He is the God of turnaround. And the pain that you've been through telling you right now, listen to me, the stuff that you wish you never went through will be the things that God uses the most in your life. Like, wait a second, pastor. I thought I was supposed to forget all that. No, you don't forget it. You just don't let it have power over you anymore. Some of you, your biggest problem, the reason why God's not using you like in a major, major way is because you're acting like you've never been through anything. I don't want nobody to know, man, what I went through in that last marriage. I don't want anybody to know the things that I went through as a child. It hurts to talk about it. I don't want them to know that I was addicted. I don't want them to know that I got a rap sheet bigger than the state of Texas. I don't want them to know. I want to just kind of look like I am today. And some of our biggest problem is, is we don't remember how bad off we were before Jesus got a hold of our lives. You just suppress that pain. You just keep ignoring it. You just keep numbing it. And God will never be able to use it in your life. Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? What is the most significant title? The Messiah. What does the Messiah mean? It literally means the anointed one. And Jesus was anointed to heal. He was anointed to preach. He literally, he turned the whole world upside down. In three years of ministry, nobody's ever seen an anointed ministry, anything remotely close to the ministry of Jesus. And the reason why he had such anointing is because he went through so much struggle. It's one reason. Because you can't have anointing without struggle. And the things that hurt the most are the testimonies and the stories of God's grace and God's mercy and God's power and God's healing and God's deliverance will be the very things that bring other people hope to get freedom and deliverance and redemption as well. So you keep hiding all that stuff. Keep acting like nothing ever happened. God's not going to use you to do anything great. I was just this last week we were doing an interview with one of the participants at the Mosaic Recovery Center for men battling addiction that we have. And he was sharing his story. And this is what I told him, because the interview was going kind of great, normal, how it should. And I said, hey, I said, I want you to go back to that pain that you felt when you lost custody of your kids. Quit suppressing that pain. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how devastating it was. And then he began to share his story from a place of hurt and pain. And there was so much anointing on it. He couldn't share it without tears streaming down his face. And as he shared it, we felt the Holy Spirit invade that room. There was such an anointing on it. Because as he shares how addiction took his kids from him. And how he missed years of their life. But Jesus got it all back. And now he's got a relationship with all of his children 
where he got to see one of his kids surrender to Jesus and actually got to be a father that baptized his own son. A son that he never thought he would ever see again. He's in a church baptizing him. And you know what that story does? There's so much anointing on it. Just sharing it right now, and it's not even my story. Somebody in this room, hope is rising in your heart that maybe I can get my kids back. Maybe I can get my mind back. Maybe I can get my freedom back. I'm telling you right now, God is going to use your testimony, your story, the pain, more than he uses anything else in your life. For me, grew up around addiction. For me, grew up around it. Man, grew up in it. Just craziness. Just father was a drug dealer, was a drug addict. My father committed suicide when I was 13 years old. I went down the same path of addiction, in and out of jail from the time I was 17. Gave my life to Jesus in a jail cell 17 years ago. And I can tell you this, God has completely and totally transformed my life. Put a calling on my life, put a purpose on my life. And people would say, you know, Kenny, you shouldn't really talk about your jail experience so much. You're a pastor now. You're not going to be able to reach a lot of people, you know, business owners and stuff like that. They're not going to really want to come to your church. Say, well, they don't want to come to church because my story. They can just go to a little frozen poodunk church down the road because we're going to preach truth in here. We're going to be real in here. Are y'all with me today? Because when I preach on addiction, there's an anointing on it because I've been set free. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. And that's who I keep preaching it for. And I'll share it till the day that I die. Because you can impress people with your strengths, but you're going to reach people with your scars. So quit hiding your scars. Quit covering them up. Quit acting like you've lived a perfect little cookie cutter life. And start getting real with the people you're connected to. And start sharing from a place of pain and hurt. And watch God use you to change the world. Amen. Let me pray for us. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want you to think about what you just heard and what God's just spoken into your life. And you're here. You say, I'm a Christian. I'm a son of God. I know I'm a follower of Christ. I know I have a relationship with Jesus. But I got to be honest, Pastor. I'm in the middle of the battle. I'm going through it right now. I am. Hey, not everything is falling apart, but I've got some really important areas in my life. And it feels like it's all just crumbling before me. And I need the Father to rescue me. I want you to know this. He's here in this place. And his arms are stretched wide. And he's ready for you to come to him. Let him in on that anxiety. Let him in on that depression. Listen, quit trying to numb it all. And take all this stuff just to numb the pain so you can forget. No, it's just going to resurface on its own anyways. Face it with the power of God surrender it to him and let him use it to change the world you said to me pastor I ask that you'd pray for me I want to pray for you now heavenly father for every person in this room that you're speaking to right now that needs to be strengthened God we come to the father we come to you we lay it at your feet God forgive us for turning to things that cannot help us but they only hurt us more God we turn to you today God we thank you that you love us that you've called us that you've chosen us And God, we acknowledge that we're desperate for you. God, we beg you to move in our lives. And as we meet with you, we will get up stronger, better, more determined, more resolved to go out and face the things that are before us and have victory over it all. Pray that in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed with nobody looking around. You're here today and you're thinking to yourself, I've got major doubts about where I stand with God. I don't know if I've trusted in Christ. I don't know if I've been saved. To be honest, I've I've played church, I've played games, but I've never, I can't remember a time I entered into a relationship with Jesus and he changed my life. I, I feel far from God. I feel distant from God. Maybe you're overwhelmed with different things that you've been turning to thinking that it'll bring relief, it's a quick fix, it brings temporary help, but then all the trouble, all the pain comes flooding in again. And you've tried a lot of different things. I would ask you today, would you try Jesus? Try him. He's the one that can give you hope. He's the one that can give you help. He's the one that can heal what's broken in your life. 
He can forgive you of all your sin and give you life eternal. He died for you. He loves you. And He paid the price for you to be saved. You say, I need that. I want that. I want to follow this man named Jesus. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to call upon his name to be saved. And we can do this together. I'm going to say a prayer out loud. And as I say it, I'm going to ask you to say it with me, silently or out loud. And you can pray and cry out to God for salvation and believe on the name of Jesus. And he'll forever change your heart and life. If that's you, pray with me now. Don't put this off. Let today be the day of your salvation. Here we go. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I ask that you would forgive me now. I believe Jesus died. I believe he rose from the dead. And today I turn from my sin and I turn to you. I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and change me from the inside out. Make all things new. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. It's in your name I pray. Amen. And with heads bowed and and eyes closed, if you just prayed with me, I'm not going to bring you to the front. I just want to see what God did in your heart, in your life. We've got a Bible we want to give you. We've got some things we want to give you as you're walking out today. But as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you just prayed with me, just shoot your hand up really high. You just made the best decision. Can you just leave those hands up for a moment? i got an usher that's going to put a card in your hand. Let us know that you prayed to receive Christ today by filling that card out. Hey, others of you, I didn't raise my hand at first, but I did. I, I said that prayer. I just made that decision. So many are, are lifting their hands now. Others of you, I did. I, I made that decision. I prayed that prayer. Hey, I want to encourage you. Let somebody know today before you leave. Anybody else? That's me. I prayed that prayer. I made that decision. Others of you, you can text the word SAVE to the number that's popping up on the screen. You can also let us know that way. Take your connection card or your digital card and swing by our Fresh Start table. It's right to your left as soon as you walk out these exit doors in the back. And there's a new believer's kit. It's a, it's a box. It's got a leather Bible in it. It's got discipleship material in it. Uh, just things that you can take on your first steps in this new spiritual journey as a follower of Christ. Well, hey, y'all can open your eyes, lift your heads. And on the count of three, can we celebrate everybody that just placed their faith in Jesus? One, two, three. Let's celebrate. Come on. Hallelujah. We celebrate. Another one. Another one. Another one. And as we're getting ready to dismiss, we've got baptisms. We've had several already be baptized today. And so if you need to be baptized, you can go ahead and and come on forward. And others of you, hopefully maybe you've already changed, you can come on forward. Those of you that still need to change, you can slide out and change now. And then there could be some of you that are here, you just gave your life to Jesus just now. And I would just just encourage you to come forward and go ahead and do this right now. Uh, That's what they did in the Bible. They'd give their lives to Jesus and then they'd have, if there would be water nearby, they would go ahead and go public and just identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through water baptism. Hey, as they're getting ready, as they're coming forward, I I do just want a couple things to remind you of. You did have that Easter invite on your seats. We've got Easter invites as you're walking out. Uh, Grab one or two of those and think about somebody that you're praying for that really needs hope, really needs Jesus in their life, and you can use that to invite them. And they are more likely to come on Easter Sunday than they are any other time out of of the year. And God can use you. Your invitation could lead to somebody's salvation. That would be powerful, wouldn't it? And then also, as we get done with baptisms and you're walking out, remember, we've got our youth bake sale. You know, I'll just say all those things are really underpriced, you know. You get like an awesome cookie for like a dollar. Hey, you can buy a cookie for $100 too, you know. Um, a dollar is really not going to do much to help anybody really go to camp. Uh, that might get them a bite of their fry that day with inflation. I don't know. Um, but, and, and, and every dollar counts for sure. But if you're able and you want to give $50, $100, if you want to sponsor a kid to go for $600, leave that there. All that 100% goes 
to these students going to camp, some that wouldn't be able to go without uh, the support of a generous church family. And so just pray and consider. It literally could change a teenager's life, okay? All right, let's give it up for those that are going public today. Come on. All right, and then others of you, you got time still to go ahead and make this right and come on forward too. What's your name? Allie, y'all give it up for Allie today. You can just take a seat right here on the edge. And then uh, just kind of scoot there towards the edge. There you go. And, uh, and Allie, we're so proud of you. You believe in Jesus? Well, today marks a new beginning for you. Amen? All right, plug your nose. It's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So proud of you. Good job. You did great. I got you here. You be really careful. You be slippery down there. Come on. Destiny, come on. Y'all give it up for Destiny going public today. So proud of you. So Destiny, today marks a new beginning. It's a fresh start for you. And uh, I'm so thrilled to see you make this decision to go public with your faith. Do you believe in Jesus? All right, you grab your nose for me. It's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So proud of you. You did awesome. Y'all give it up for Destiny one more time. Here, be careful. It gets real slick right here. All right, praise the Lord. All right, I believe that's everybody. Anybody else making a move to come forward? Okay. Anybody else? Nope. All right, hey, y'all are dismissed. Those that are staying for the made for this after party, give us a few minutes and we'll be set up right here in the auditorium. And we love you. We'll see you next week. God bless you.